for being here today. Um, here's kind of the schedule of how we're going to go over things. I take you as a highly literate group of folks and that the policy is there for you to kind of if you've already been through it or you will be going through it. I'm going to hit the high points of a lot of it and a lot of it will come through our media and a lot of it will just be presented out. Um, on my best, I'm, my, I'm going to try to get through this in about an hour. My best and on time as ever has been is 37 minutes and 30 seconds, 30 seconds. However, you play a part in making that happen. Because there's some people in this room that want to hear it and go. There are some people in this room that want to hear it and have questions to ask. If you are on the go end, here's how you help yourself. The people that have questions, they use the note cards at your table. And if you have a question that needs to come up, write it down and I will stay as long as you want to answer your questions. After that, going through the policy. Because it could be a simple answer or a quiet answer. A lot of times when it comes to safe sanctuaries, there are policies that are national policies, there are state policies, and conference policies, and then there are special church policies. And identifying how those things come out can help know how those things come across for you. Um, so before we get started, you get a chance to ask a question. Everybody understand that? Good, good. Okay, um, I'm Lee Barnes. I've been a part of United Methodist Family Ministry since 1992. I did ministry before there were safe sanctuaries, so we had none of these rules to follow, and we're lucky we didn't get sued or other people didn't get hurt along the way. What we're going to do today is take a 30,000-foot view at sometimes and sometimes a five-foot view of some things. I have some stories about how things turned out good and how things didn't turn out good. Uh, just kind of walk us through this policy. But as you think about it and process through, just kind of think about, put yourself in the situation because we have people that work with preschoolers in the room and people that work with seniors in high school in the room. The policy is designed for children, youth, and vulnerable adults. So we have a wide spectrum that we're going to cover in one policy. And y'all did good because y'all's is thinner than most places that I've ever come across. So let me say a prayer for us and we're going to roll. Let's pray. Hey, God, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for, we can't go a place where you're not. And I thank you for the people that fought ahead in our baptismal covenant and included all of us in taking care of children, youth, and vulnerable adults. As we look into what is now in this policy and how you've empowered us to be you to whoever we come in contact with, whether it's a preschooler, whether it's a child, whether it's a youth, whether it's anybody, please let us reflect that and kind of understand where we are in that and move us forward. We love you. Amen. Amen. All right, to get started, kind of where you start, what Safe Sanctuaries is, it is, it is not a something that inhibits ministry. It's something that protects the adults that do ministry and the youth, adults, vulnerable staff, and staff that works with that. A lot of people sometimes want to make it into a protection policy, want to turn it into a rule book. It's not that. What this is, is this provides a great environment for us to do ministry safely. If you want to check a book out, it's out there, it's called Better Safe Than Sued. That's the games we used to play before we were going to get sued. You know, these are, this is the reason you don't play Chubby Bunny anymore. This is the reason you don't put people in situations that are, that are, um, it could be possible danger involved. So we're going to move through this with this. Um. The reason we do this for safe sanctuaries, the why is this. We've been entrusted by God to care for his children no matter what their age. Period. By the baptismal covenant, everyone that's ever sat in a baptism is already in on this. We've already said, no matter how old this child is, we'll take care of them. So we live into that. Another reason that comes into this is parents look for safety. If you want to have a volunteer, if you want to have a visitor not come back, show them, show them an unsafe environment for their child. No matter what the age is. That's the reason we always encourage people to put the safe sanctuary policy on their website. And you have to reflect in your ministry what's in the policy. If you're not going to live it out, take it out. Because that's the standard you will be held to. But parents, especially nowadays, look for a safe environment for their child no matter what age they are. And they'll play into that. And lastly, we've kind of come into this. We've talked about the baptismal covenant of how we've come into that. 
Next step is this. Say sanctuary and the healthy boundaries combined together allow us to live and serve in healthy relationships that connect and reveal God's love for all of us. If you ever want a great context of what Safe Sanctuaries really is, this book right here, Smaller Church, Youth Ministry, No Staff, No Money, No Problem. Brad Fiscus is the co coordinator of family ministry for the Tennessee Conference. He helped put a lot of this presentation together, and he wrote that book. I think it's chapter 8. It's all about safe sanctuaries, and it explains it better than anybody can. About how you live into it and what, is it, what it's for. And how we all agree to move forward into this and all our ministries together. Why do we do this? These are the statistics that just happened. Now, I'm going to tell you this also, too. Safe sanctuaries is a wonderful policy. If you want to take this and get a further in-depth model of what ministry and protective policies are for children and youth, go to your school and ask for the training that they have. Because any public school or private school should offer training this way. Or if you work for the YMCA or know the ones apart, they have a training call from darkness to light. What they do is they base their policy on survival of sexual abuse. So they have people tell their stories and how that abuse could be prevented. <coughs> if you want to take it a little bit further, we'll pull some of that from here with that. But if we go through a couple of statistics that come across, one in five girls and one in 20 boys uh, is a victim of childhood abuse. That's current statistics for this year. And that number is not going away. In fact, it's going up. The growing trend in a, a, a abuse situations right now, we'll get to it when we talk about bathrooms, is not adult child abuse, but child child abuse. And that's one thing we have to we have to maintain a careful eye on of what, and all the age groups that we pay attention to. So a reported study showed that twenty percent of adult females and five percent of adult males recall a childhood sexual assault or sexual abuse incident. And the thing about it is no one's remembering this until about their late 40s to 50s. And counseling, counseling offices are booming because it's been pushed aside and pushed aside for so long that all of a sudden they're sitting in an office, the counselor's office, and they realize why they act this way, and then they live in, oh, this happened. And they haven't been able to admit it to themselves from that. By doing the policies we'll put into place, this will prevent that for future generations and move forward. During a one-year time, 60% of youth, 14 to 17, have been sexually victimized. I don't know how to say anything else about it. As we move through these statistics, these are the aspects <coughs> that we are the agents to, get to, to, to turn around. 28% of youth, 14 to 17, have been victimized. And this is the age range that we will deal, deal with the most. Because this is, the, this is the age range where this occurs, but how often, often think time that works with this, this is the age range to where we have the most impact on a child. And that when they come during this time, this is the time we get to own them. If we don't own them during this time, we're not going to own them later on. And when we provide a safe, secure environment, and parents know and guardians know we're providing that environment, this is the thing that helps us move forward to gather together like this, to think about how can we make this work together for all of our ministries thinking together. The thing about safe sanctuaries is this, you have one policy for everybody here, but you can't think individually about it. You have to think, how does the preschool policy live into the children's policy, live into the middle school policy, live into the high school policy, live into the vulnerable adult policy? Because you think continually through that for the whole safety of everybody. That's the reason everybody sits through the whole training. You don't get a compartmentalized training. Because you may be thinking, I change diapers all the time. Why do I need to know about van travel? Because a parent's going to ask you, because like that child is going to grow up into the youth ministry. And they're going to want to know what you know about that and know you have a part in playing a part in that. Because you may grow with that child as they grow through ministry. And this is the one that, this is the scary part right here. Um, most predators when interviewed knows that churches are the easy spots. Because they are the ones that often lack the security uh, to, to be a part of. If you think about it, Sunday morning, anybody comes in and out of your doors. Unless you have a lockdown policy to where you're checking in with badges, of which you're growing to. Uh, if you're checking children in and out the way you should, this is what it says. I consider church people easy to fool. They have a trust that comes from being Christians. They tend to be better folks all around. They seem to want to believe in the good that exists in people. And that's a quote. This comes across multiple levels of sex offenders. 
And that so a lot of times churches are vulnerable targets for this. I, I can't name an incident where I've seen this happen, but I know of, after sitting through many, many trainings, of hearing story, I mean, hearing offenders talk about how just you can how easy it is to walk in as opposed to other places. You can't get in a school without checking in a door, or without a badge, or without a training, or without an access. Churches are different places. You have to think about what do we do as for our church that makes that for our preschool hall, for our children's ministry, for our youth ministry. What makes us the most secure? What we're going to do today is we're going to provide the best you can do. One thing about safe sanctuaries is that in every, in every policy, there's built in an elasticity clause. And that there are rules that are hardcore and set, and there are other things that say we will do the best that we can do because you're growing along. Because let's say it's youth travel. You may say you're going off to a camp, and they say your rooms are one way, and then you get there, and your rooms aren't that way. And you have to, you're, instead of having these two areas for men and women, they're supposed to be miles apart to be together, you're in a gym with a, with a tarp wall separating you. You laugh, been there. And you got to adjust and be flexible with it. Same thing happens with our policies. You move through the best situations you can make it work for that. And here's the reason we have this. This is our process that we go through. Mandatory training every year. The reason you have mandatory training every year is because I recommend everybody changes their policy every year. Because you don't know what's coming. I was, we were talking about this earlier before we got in here. No one knew 10 years ago how much technology was going to change our lives. And now we're catching up to that. And the last slide I'm going to show you is things that are going to, things that are coming now. And I encourage you to write down on those cards what's something that's coming that you might think we need to change. And then about May, sit down with some folks and go, what do we need to do to get ready for the next for August training to go from there? You have a written application that requires your social security number. The reason that's on there is because that does a background check on you. The background check that y'all use does a nationwide check and a state check. And that works through everything that you have to do. You have a multi-state record, a sex offender registry, social security verification. You do not have a credit check. We really don't care about your church history or your credit card history. But everything else, we have to have that number to go forward, to be a part of that. That just keeps everybody safe and accountable. Those number, those papers are kept in a safe for a decade before they're destroyed. Years and years, there's, there's a special place, there's rules of where they have to go. And then they're, then they're totally destroyed and gone from there. So if you're a little concerned about doing that, giving your number out, trust me, it's safe because the policies that go have to go with that. Also, the six-month rule applies here at the church, too. You don't really get to be involved with, your, with, with, with kids or youth or anybody until somebody knows you here, which I think is a wonderful thing to work with, and that you get to know the ins and outs. Given six months is a little bit, you don't know, that, but that's a good number to start with before you can have a group or move on, with, move on yourself. That's not a set rule. You can change that by church, and a lot of people do. Some places don't even have that. And I'm going, like, how in the world would you just drop somebody you just met two weeks ago into a small group with somebody that meets somewhere else? And believe it or not, people do it all the time. Because they need a body and they want to fill a body. Put a slide in, put somebody in a slot. And this is not by this policy, this is not something that we do with that. There we go. Let's get into some of our other our basic rules that make up safe sanctuaries. It'll be on your sheet that you have there. The main rule, the first rules that we start with are the five-year rule. In that, what you do is you kind of you have the oldest person teaching the room has to be five years older than anybody in the room. The policy that comes across. Trust me, all of y'all fit to teach the, the preschool class. You're good. <laughs> you get on up, you go there, but I'm one of these people too. But this also helps when you work with this. This sets up to where your high schoolers can teach your elementary kids, your middle schoolers can help teach your um, preschool kids. So if you want help to come across, because the kids expect adults to come teach them stuff. You put one of those kids in the room with you, they'll be more than happy to help you move along. But it's got to be the main teacher has to be five years of age that comes across with that. Two adult rule. 
You're never alone with a kid or a child, period. That's, that's got to go. That's one thing. That has, that, that's, that's a standard. Now, the thing about this, we're going to get to another slide that goes further on. That, not, that doesn't just apply here. That applies anywhere. That applies in a car. That applies anywhere. You need to have two unrelated adults, whatever that it is. I had a friend named Joe who called me today, and that um, uh, he had an incident to where a foreign exchange student always wanted to stay late, and she wouldn't tell her parents when to pick him up, where she would have to be the last person left of him in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Now, you don't think people are manipulative to the time, but sometimes kids are very manipulative. So let me tell you what to do. If you ever get stuck in a situation like that of how it goes, your best friend is your cell phone. So if you ever think you're in an alone situation, FaceTime or audio call or video call somebody. If by weather or natural disaster you have to drive somebody home from an event and you were by yourself, call somebody or have a video call. That sets up a regulatory thing where it watches what's happened for you. And then you report it to the supervisor as far as it happens and goes down. That it just happened and go from there. Also, as you're thinking about your way classes go, think about every year where classes are going to meet and how you can have people away where there not be a time to be alone. Or the best thing you can ever do is one of the, a job we found for the youth workers when we did it is called the Roamer. There is somebody who was the rascal in youth group that knew how to sneak out of everywhere that will walk through your building and find the sneak out places. And let that person walk the hallways to make sure everything is safe and secure. And that helps with this policy of the never alone. Somebody will be there moving around and go through. One thing I like that y'all have to do is that you have this advanced notice rule and permission rule that's there. You have it in your policy that parents and guardians have to know what's going to happen. And not a lot of places don't have that. That's golden right there. So there's no surprises. If I was a youth, if I was a, if my children were coming to your youth group, that would, that would, that rule would get me here. Because I know you've already thought ahead and everything that you've done to give me notice of what's going to happen. And I'm not going to suddenly pull up to the church and realize everyone's at Bojangles and I didn't get told. You know, you have special rules that come up. This is on page seven. For uh, extended trips and other activities, what happens with that is, especially when you're dealing with youth and upper elementary events, you don't know sometimes when things are going to change because of where you are. And you've already built that in of what this is, of the policies that kind of come in of how that works. And volunteers are already trained to move forward and to do that. And also considering when you're looking at visitors that come in, do we know these people? Do we not know these people? What have we heard? And how do we think about that policy, especially when you have people traveling with you for the first time? This is about meeting, a meeting away. It just talks about the different places you can be. Go ahead and think about that too. Even with children, even with children and youth, when you pull off a child to speak to them by themselves, always be in view of someone else. When you when someone's walking the baby down the hallway, patting them because they're crying or they got gas or whatever, and they just want to try to get that burp out. You're trying to have somebody watch to be there. I have to give you the far end of the way that this thing's happened because this is the world that we live in today with that. Just to keep an eye on, what this, an eye on how things are. Um, information about minors that come about. One thing I always highly recommend is when you do your health forms for children and youth is that it's the most extensive form you can make. You need to find out, mom, you know, find out all the information about where they live, mom and dad's phone number, mom and dad's every, uh, allergies, that, but also you need to know, um, can you take a picture of that child? Um, we'll get into a lot of other slides. I'll jump around a little bit. There's a lot of times where we can't take pictures of people because they're, they're in protective custody. And church is a safe place. If nobody can just whip out their camera and start taking it. That needs to be something on your form that's listed that's already on your form. But to be aware of that as a teacher is you can't just start taking pictures and post them up because that could jeopardize someone's relationship or jeopardize their safety by something like that going up. And you move through that. i get you to page 8. And then you, uh, I was looking at your vehicle policy on page 8 and 9. I'm not going to hit the high point of all of that, but that's amazing what you've already thought about of how to do it, who rides with who, how that works, who can sit where places. 
you know, things that way. So as you're traveling with children or with youth, however you're allowed with that, I would always tell people that the best thing you can always do is what's already you have stated here is that take the take the church vehicles, personal vehicles, personal vehicles to be the last resort of that. And yet again, that's another place where you're never alone. With a child, you always have two people in there just in case something happens. But just yet, if that doesn't occur, you have that phone to take place of what's happening to go from there. This is the golden part right here. I'm going to get there next. Open doors and windows. I'm a dad and I love dad jokes. This is a jar. All doors should be a jar. Or have a window. If you have to, get a Sharpie, write an A on it. We'll go from there. If you really want it further noticed, watch all three seasons of Stranger Things and notice they don't close doors. Because if you watch the if you watch the first season that goes through, Eleven will not go anywhere with a closed door. She always wants the door open. And if you watch the third season, when she wants to go in, wants to be in her in a room alone with her boyfriend with the door closed, her 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 parental figure always goes three inches, <laughs> and it keeps the door open for your safety. When there's a door, y'all, as all I think United Method, I think we opened up a whole new job for all carpenters when we started the policy of a window. And, all the windows and the doors. Because everyone would come in and cut. If you don't have the Dutch doors, to have the, the doors where you the doors with windows in them. And if you don't have that, just prop it open. Here's what I'm not for. So I've seen churches and safe sanctuaries where if they don't have two adults in their room, they will close the class off and they will send the kids back to worship with their with their parents. If we don't have the adults, you gotta close the class door. I'm not for that. That makes this restrictive. What you got to do is say, okay, we're going to leave the door ajar and the roamer is going to keep coming by and walk from there. It's policies that you make work for you. But as you go around, just see as you just check through as it comes in. Really, the only doors in the United Methodist Church that don't have windows are the bathrooms. Every other place has a way for that to clear, has a way to be there. And this is the reason behind it. Because I'll say this, I'll say this, and I mean this humorously, but also I mean this the way it is. Safe sanctuaries is the best, worst, knee-jerk reaction to taking care of children, youth, and vulnerable adults. The only reason we have these policies is because of what happened in the Catholic Church in the late 90s. Nobody was ready for that. Nobody thought about having these policies until that happened. And we realized we all got to catch up. And also we realized that we're in a set of waves coming in of changes of culture, of changes that happen. And you can look to see Everyone get, got hit by that wave when it came through because nobody was ready. And now as a body, what you can do is you think about these things. You look to the wave and you have a choice. You can surf the wave or you can get crushed by it. A lot of fleet places don't have a technology section. You have an extensive technology section. Because they're like, oh no, we don't need anything about that. Oh no, no, no. Think about what happens. You're probably thinking right now, there's something well, there's not in here. We haven't talked about that. Those are the things you kind of got to keep up with and go with. That's doors and windows about how to do that. It's a very simple policy. Good. That's registration forms that we already talked about. Of moving through. I highly recommend that for. Also for y'all as leaders. If, you, if somebody needs to know something about you. About a condition. About an allergy. Let that happen. Let that be known too. Because the last thing you want to happen is you be teaching a class. Somebody brings a snack. You're allergic to it. And all of a sudden you pass out in class. And you're laying on the floor in the midst of a midst of a bunch of three-year-olds because of your allergy. And no one knows where your epipenia is, but you know where everyone else's epipenia is. How do you make that possible? Make it aware for everyone and how that comes around for that. And also make it, make it a choice. If you're with a group of kids consistently, ask your leader for the forms to know what's going on. So you know who has what, who can have this, and who might come around for this. Also, I encourage with this too, that nobody takes me up on this, please be the bunch that does. Uh, for every class that you're in, keep a notebook for how everybody acts every week. So if you ever get asked by, if you ever, ever have to talk to a parent about something, you have a log. Are you keeping notes on your kids? Yeah, I teach sixth grade boys every, every, every Sunday night. I have sixth grade boys for two hours. I have 14 of them that I work with. They're my best. I like working with clay, not concrete. It's my whole thing. 
But when at the end of the day, I sit down, at the end of the night, I sit down with my leader and I take notes on my phone about how everybody acted. I go person by person. Who was good, who wasn't good. So when my parent comes back to me or I have to report to my leader that I have an issue with somebody, I go, here's, the, here's what's happened throughout the week, throughout the months. And I have dates of what went down. Now, I've had nothing to report other than they really liked it. We named the group the Trash Pandas. They really got loud about that one. But as you go through, this helps you realize what's happening. It really doesn't matter for your age group, who bites in the preschool hallway, up all the way through offensive language and other things. Just to see what's happening. But also, that's a warning sign. You can see predictable patterns that come through some of this. And that sometimes, if, there's a tr if it's the switching week, and you know it's, there's the divorce family and the switching week, we always act bad on the switching week, you know how to be prepared for that. Things that you can know from that comes from registration forms. We kind of covered traveling in the vehicles. Uh, beyond that, just be aware. Read through. You're already going to be asked if you've read the whole policy. Know it for everyone else, but also know it to be a guardian. If you see something and it's not a rule not being followed, to make to tell somebody. Because everyone in this room is the is the is the guardian of the safe sanctuary policy. To make sure everything is followed. To go through because if something is not followed and you get caught by it, you're liable. That's the reason I always encourage and I say it over and over again that if you're not going to follow the rule, don't put it in the policy. Because when, when, when administrative council approves this, that's what you say you're going to go by and live in. And believe it or not, there are tons of people. I find it as a youth worker, like I say, I've been around youth ministry since about 1990. And when the seniors graduate four years later, I find out later what happened in the van. And the more you can do on the preventative side helps a whole lot. Of that, of watching the ratios of where it is, making sure you can see everybody, and holding up, and the whole thing that goes there. Let me give you one. Well, I'll give you one piece of, of van advice for before you go on. If you really want to, if you really want to know what's happening in the youth group, unplug your headphones from whatever device you listen to, then put your headphones in your ears, and everyone they'll think you're listening to music, and then listen to what's going on, and you'll hear everything. You'll be able to hear row by row if you travel by van of what's going on and then go on from there. As you spread, as leaders are spread throughout the vehicles, do the same thing. It helps to go from there. If you look on page 10, this is a required statement for all safe sanctuary policies, is ratios. It pops up in every policy that we have. I'm going to go over these real quick for you. In that uh, preschool, you're two teachers to 15 students. Elementary, you're two teachers to 25. Youth, two teachers to 30. And those are those are the basic ones you have to get to. But think about it is know your group. If you need more people in the room, I always say always have more people in the room than you need. Just in case someone goes down or the other, um, a child goes down, you have to send somebody out. How they go. These are the standard things that you have to go by. Um, following that is your overnight rule. And yet again, this is one of those things for, for any ministry. You could do this for elementary when you go camping. You could do this for anybody where you're going to move folks. If you're going to go, sir, I, whenever I go somewhere overnight, I plan on not being what's expected. I just want to be surprised by everything working right. <coughs> but usually go through it as thinking, what if I have to make a change in my policy? What if I have, we have to stay in a place that's not the way it is? What if we have to be in a cabin with girls and guys? No one our policy says we can't do that. How can I make this work from there? But as you go along, you'll see some of these policies that have to be flexible as they go, and this is the number one that is. Because if you want to stay, if you want the best way to avoid a problem with any of this is go to all, go, always go to United Methodist events because they know what safe sanctuaries is. When you start going to other denominational events, they have no concept. They won't give you a room for your adults. They just think the adults will stay in the room with the kids. That's, a, that's not what we do, in a way, until, until that happens from there. Now, I'm going to jump off a little bit on this one, and I'll come right back to it. Because two schools of thought, uh, when it comes down to hotel rooms and, and youth. Uh, the first school of thought is they are never in the room together. And 
I'm not a fan of the school of thought because I have been, I was with a pat. Is time gone? Good. Okay. Um, um, I watched, I was a part of a, um, I heard this story from a friend who was a part of a youth ministry who's the pastor's son took three seniors and they five-starred a freshman boy that was accidentally put in their room. Now, what a five-star is, is you hold somebody against the wall, lift their shirt up, and slap them hard enough with your hand to where you get the five points of a star. He got three of those. And they got the pictures and they post them. Uh, the reason we know that is because that is one of the reasons of saying you never put kids alone in a room. That's the downfall of that. However, you can't put an adult in a room if there's an incident that that happens, you have to have an adult somewhere in the room. The way you beat that is you have two rooms with an adjoining door. And that door is ajar. You're in that time. You can have fixed rules that work really well until something, until an incident happens. And then you go from there. Do you see my rule way this works? It's got to be flexible in the way that it happens. Because sometimes you can be given space you have to work with. Other times your history will help develop what happens from there. Guidelines for physical touch. This is huge and it covers everybody. Um, preschoolers, you know, up until lap sitting works good up until kindergarten. The standard policy is there's no nobody sits in laps after that. And then it kind of develops own from there. Um, there there's t-shirts you can get if you really want to make jokes of them that say free side hugs. I'm in ministry, free side hugs. Because and you go from there, that's the best way to do it. High fives, pats on the back, holding on your arms. The, safety, the policy has a chart for you to read about there. The best thing you can do is go with, go with what you know. Because you never know what that child has been through and know, know what your touch will do to that child. I was on a retreat one time way back in the 90s when we didn't have safe sanctuaries. And part of the retreat was everybody got a back rub. Yes, it was creepy. I hated it. I'm not a touch person whole nine yards. But there were people in that room that had experienced abuse, and you could see it. <clears throat> so when somebody they didn't know touched them from the behind they couldn't see, one kid took a swing. You've got to be aware of appropriate touch. You have a chart that's here. I would say follow that. Talk to how you want that developed out. And that goes throughout the ages to work from there. What your hugs look like. What your appropriation looks like, you know, handshake, pats, elbows, you know, watch the YouTube videos that go around the Facebook videos of the teachers that do the high five weird stuff before going in their class. The weirder you get, the more they'll like it. So if you're a Sunday school teacher of elementary children and you want to express the happiness that they're there, let them all come up with their handshake and you learn their handshakes before they come in. That way you get your touch fixed and they get appreciation for showing up and go from there. Kind of the way that that flows across the set. Overnight say we got that. And hold on, Eric. And I'm going to say this a little. I'm going to say this briefly. And I'm going to get into this more as we go. Is that we, the rule we used to think in ministry is that um, you have red, that are the girls, and blue are the boys, and we don't want purple. purple. <laughs> no purple. However, we do not live in a purple world anymore. We live in a world that is multicolored. We live in a world that's darker shades of blue, that are darker shades of red, that are lighter shades, back and forth. And in your ministry, probably starting about 10 years old, moving forward, you're going to have different genders identifying at all different aspects. So when it comes to doing rooming like this, you need to be considerate of who's with who. And know what's happening. Because if you go explicitly with girl and guy, you could be putting two dating people in the same room. I don't say that to shock you. I say, welcome to the world. I'm moving forward. And that also you need to be protective of those folks that are there. And that it could be dangerous for them to be in that room with certain people in your group. So as you think through these policies and you have to put people in rooms for that age group, Normally, for the Raleigh area that I'm a part of, the 100 churches that are part of the Capital District, the normal time of coming out in a way is about confirmation. Because that's when I get the most phone calls because they go, 
Um, Johnny, who used to be, Jane, who used to be Johnny, is now identifying as a girl, and I don't know what group to put her in for confirmation small group. What do I do? You know, I go, I go. What do you say? Sanctuary's policy do? Say. Like, oh, we haven't we haven't talked about that. I go. Well, it's about time to talk about it. First of all, and second time is the school. You know, follow your school policy or follow what happens. So that's something as you have to have a broader conversation. It's something that is already present in your ministry, in your church, in your environment. Um, so how do you move forward with that <coughs> as it goes from there? Um, Discipline. Let me cover this one first. For special youth considerations on page 12. Um, basically what happens here is this applies for everybody. And these are things that you don't think have to be said, but let me say them to you. You always have to watch the people you're in charge of, no matter what age they are. Wherever they're, where they're small ones, you have to watch them really closer. Where they're older ones, you, there's not an age we don't get away from watching them. Or you can designate the tattletale, they'll bribe them and they'll tell you everything. It's standards all the way across. Always keep a policy of what's happening. Be aware of what's going on as you move forward with that. Um, let me cover this one too. Bottom of page 12, bathroom rules. I'm going to tell you the policy, the way that it works. I'm going to tell you some other stuff that works with this. Um, to me, the most dangerous place for possible abuse in a church is the bathroom. Because we, yet again, as we talked about earlier on, is that the rising trend that we have is is child child abuse that happened, and when people are in there, one thing I suggest that you do is whenever you take a group to the bathroom, youth really doesn't apply to youth right now. Let me just speak to people that deal with children. Is that as the adult go into the bathroom first and make sure it is empty, check it out, and then, however you choose to. Send them in and, uh, and have them go back out. If you have to assist, have that second person that's there watching and helping from there. That is your most vulnerable spot that you have. And the policy you have states that. Uh, the YMCA policy from darkness to light states it this way. And that they keep cones outside of every bathroom. And after somebody has to go to the bathroom, an adult goes in, makes sure it's empty, and then one at a time, children go to the bathroom with the cone, keeping adults and anyone else out. And as a teacher, you're thinking, I'll never get to teach. If they all want to go by themselves, you know, I'll take safety over that any day. As your policy is now, they can you stand at the door and they can go in, and that's great for right now. I just encourage you to think later on. As you more as you grow, and I tell you what I meet with the, with you folks, as you grow and your numbers increase, that might be an inconvenient process for you. So how do you make that work to fit for the safety and security of all? And you move forward with that. Discipline. Oh, while we're on this, let's do this one. Um, diapers. Um, any approved volunteer may change diapers while paid nursing work and chocolate workers are in the same room. If you're in youth ministry, don't change diaper. Youth workers. <laughs> Unless it's part of the game. And I know a great game you can play with that. Discipline. We don't do discipline. There is no, never any corporate discipline. However, like I said, I did encourage you with your, with your notebook to keep track of things. And pay attention to how your group works. Because you're safe in the, in the policy. You don't have a three strike rule. You don't have anything that comes in that comes forward that way. So as you're doing discipline, make sure you keep your supervisors informed of what happens and how that goes from there. Um, reporting. This is, the hard, this is the hardest thing I have to talk to you about. So um, if there is an incident that occurs, automatically let the supervisor know, period. There are forms that will be available throughout your church. And you might think you're, gonna, you're doing the best thing you could ever do for a person. And it turns out to be a violation. Let me give you an example. I had a friend named Bob, and his real name is Bob. And he, he lets me tell this story. We have family promise that comes to our church every so often. It's called Interfaith Hospitality Network. Where homeless families lived in our church for a week 
and moved on while they shopped, while they went around and developed their lives with the school, had jobs and things. Bob was working that day, and I was coming in to help serve dinner. Bob was there bringing people in and helping out that way. And a single mom comes in with two children. She had been working all day. The kids had been at school, and she, he said she had that look like she needed help. So she, Bob walks up to this mom and goes, can I help? Can, what can I do for you? Can I really help you out? And she looks at Bob straight in the eyes and goes, I could really, I could really use a nap. Do you mind bathing my boys? And Bob said, sure. Why don't you go lay down in the room and I'll take the boys and I'll take them to shower. They were seven and three. Bob participated in bathing the boys in the whole nine yards. From shampoo, bathing, toweling, whole nine yards. He'd been trained in Sage Shakespeare. He knew what not to do. So I come in from dinner and I walk around and I go, Hey Bob, how's it going? What's going on? He goes, you will not believe he was so proud of himself. He goes, I got to help out. Susie came in with her boys and she needed an ounce. So I just let her go now and I took her, walked those boys right in the bathroom and I gave them a bath. Bob was a small person and I was able to pick him up and put him against the wall. And I said, you did what? And we marched down to the forum, filled out everything that was written on it. Who was there? How was there? What was happening? As the forum, as this dictates, you write everything down. We got in my car. We drove to the pastor's house, dropped off the form. He explained what happened. We went to the chair of SBRC's house and explained what happened. Y'all have a different committee structure that works with that for y'all. But so we had to be know everything that had to happen, had to be notified right then and there when something like that is breached. You will never have a Bob incident, I hope. Y'all are kind-hearted people. You, you might. I never know. But when something happens and there's an incident, you have to report it immediately and follow all the procedures. The, fill out the paperwork. You're playing a game and somebody gets hurt. Fill out the paperwork, let it get happen. Also things that happen reporting. If the child or youth says something, something to you about abuse, there's no question, you tell your supervisor, period, immediately. And we're a reporting state. They'll know what to do. If an incident happens here at the church where one of these things happens and it gets news about what's going on, only the lead pastor, if you read your policy, is allowed to report and talk to the news about it. Nothing goes on social media. Nothing goes in conversation. Nothing, they report that out and talk about what happens from there. That's, that's kind of the standard quota about state sanctuary policies in that. This is the hard part of the policy. This is the when something goes wrong. This is what you never want to have to experience. That's the reason we come to these to learn all the other stuff so we don't have to worry about this happening. However, there are structures set in place just in case that this happened. There's a whole section on how to report. I've walked kind of through, walk, you, walk, walk you through it. Um, as you listen to children, as you talk, as you listen to youth and children, if something like that comes up, first thing you do is tell somebody and you tell your supervisor. Our youth workers, our family ministers, our senior pastors, our associate pastors. Straight line. And let them know, and they will give you guidance as to go forward as to what happened with that. Now, this is the time I will say this. Any questions on that part? It's a straight line. There's no hold back. Even if, even if there's a thought of something happening, an inkling, you go and you tell I would much rather be proved wrong <coughs> than, than something continue going on that's totally wrong. So, we move on. Last thing, sort of. I'm way off. <coughs> this is the kind of we covered that one. I think that I agree Social media. If you want to get in trouble in the world today, this is the way to get in trouble. I've had more to do it. One of the hardest things you'll ever have to do is if you're in a position of authority in a church and you have to fire a volunteer. This is tough. It's messy. But I've seen more volunteers and more family ministry people fired over social media than anything else. And the reason is why 
And I say this because I, want, I, I coach youth workers a whole lot. And if I see something come up on their page, we have a code word, a code phrase. That's me telling them they go too, they've gone too far. If I see something happen on their social media or they start ranting about something happening, I shoot them a text and it says, get a dog. Because they don't need to complain to the world about what's going on in their life or what's happening in their church and the whole nine yards. If they can't get a friend, they need to get a dog to relate to. That's what I have at home. When I get frustrated, I go to the dog. Because they just sit there and look at me stupid and don't listen to anything I have to say as long as I keep feeding. When it comes to social media use, you've got to be careful. Especially in the, in the, in the political year that's coming up. <coughs> As a people involved in this, here's what I would recommend to you to do. If you're not in social media, you're already set. But if you are in, close your accounts. Lock them to secure mode. Because you will get five, six, seven-year-olds asking to be your friends. Because there are parents that allow their children to have social media that they don't have social media, and they will not track their children as to what's happening. I was driving home to the National Youth Worker Convention in, um, in uh, Nashville, and I had to do three hours of counseling with a small group leader because one of her small group girls um, had videoed her, her and her boyfriend, and I'll explain this later if you don't know what this is, actually shotgunning a joint with a shotgun on Instagram. So what that happens is you crack the, you crack the double barrel open and this was all being videoed for the world to see because she had thousands of friends. And they inhaled as much as they could, and the girl had the barrel end, and the boy had the breech end, and he blew it through. And they called me to ask me what to do. Because the parent didn't have social media and didn't know what was going on. As a, as a leader that connects, because they were over 13. If a child is over 13, I feel they're safe to have social media. If they are younger than that, they're, somebody lied. Because every form says you have to be 13 to have it. But if you're on Facebook, if you are on Instagram, if you are on Snapchat, if you are we even still on the Vine, you know, whatever you're still on back then, you know, and a child hears you're a part of it, they will try to friend you to see what your life is like. Say no. Say, go ahead and tell them up front that you have your rules of that. And go from there. Because you're getting in youth workers, if you're over 13, that's fine. We already talked about instances and fences in the whole nine yards of regular accounts and fake accounts to watch out for. But remember, if you are on social media and somebody connects with you with that way, remember what you have on that, that your life is laid out there. I, I propose you go and purge your pictures now of what could be there. Of what you did, because it was really awkward, I always tell youth workers, it's, it's really, really awkward when you show up on Sunday night to lead your small group, and one of your members asks you about what you were drinking on Saturday that that person posted that picture you of. And it's even weirder when it's your Sunday school class on Sunday morning and you teach seven-year-olds. You know? Be very aware in today's world, because the young, they're, they're, they're not getting less tech at they're just getting more tech savvy. Remember, and as a whole with the generations that we have, um, there's a phrase I use with them is called kagoi, K-O-G-O-Y. Kids are getting older, younger. 15 years ago, we ended with gatekeepers to information. There is no gatekeeper. There's Google. <coughs> Anybody can find anything they want. The number one search engine in the world today is not Google, however. It's YouTube. Because when you want to find out how to do something, they just go on YouTube and find out how to do it. Any kid, any child knows how to use that now. So if you ask them, where did you learn that? And they say, YouTube, they're telling you the truth. You know, be aware of all of that. Because they're going to be bringing that. However, I know this too. I'll say this to you. Especially... Um, um, Children's workers, because youth are pretty much, youth have their stuff out. They will have their phone out. They're not ashamed of it. Don't think those third, fourth, and fifth graders don't have something on their bodies. Because I've learned this working, especially with fourth and fifth graders. If they come in with a backpack or come in with a purse, first thing I do is search it. Because they've got something on them and they're not supposed to have. So I don't know what your policies are of having 
technology in Sunday school rooms. But I'd be aware of what's coming in there and what's, what's happening with that. Um, from us, go from here. Um, they always friend you. Be aware of what's happening. And the reason I say the fence is there because there's regular accounts and, and the fake accounts that kids have. Those are starting down 9, 10, 11 also now. Because they know if they have an account their parent is watching, odds are they have a fake account their sibling is watching. To make sure, hopefully that works from there. With your forms, always make sure, never ever take a picture or a video of anybody you don't know that can't be a part of. A part of that. Whole nine yards, and we covered that earlier. Closed groups. Let me tell you this too, because one thing one thing's really good about Facebook that I really like, I'm in a whole bunch of Facebook groups for youth workers. And there's Facebook groups for children's workers that volunteers can be a part of and that paid people can be a part of in the whole nine yards. When they say it's secret and no one tells what's happened, they lie. Anything you said in that group is going to be available to everybody. So if you're going to go on a group and rant about how bad it is here and we, the rules are bad and we don't like that, somebody's going to know about it. You know, there's no such thing as a closed group. We're going to make it an hour. Uh, if I can get back to that last one, please. That one. Let's go one more. And then one more. And this is what I'll say, too, about, about this, about LGBTQAI uh, incidences that come through. Uh, like I say, confirmation age is about the time when they start owning their own gender. And um, school system goes by, by, um, by birth certificate. That's a policy you choose to make it your own. If you're in a group where a child chooses to identify as something other than what they present as to you, please accommodate with them and ask them what they want to be called by. Especially if their parents are a part of this. Because it kind of works through here. It's a huge issue for parents on all sides. And it's uh, not a political issue from there. Last slide, please. Dana, could you give me the last one? One more. Let's go, let's go all the way to the end. All right. I want to close this up with this. this. This is the reason that I think you need to evaluate your policies annually. Because we have this meeting. This is where you are right now. A year from now, something will be different. Because in this policy, there's absolutely nothing about service animals. I don't be. I had this surprise with the church that I worked at, and that someone just showed someone that had been a member just showed up with a service animal and expected to be let into the class, and they said no. They would not let. It was a. It was a. It was a dog that detected diabetes. They would really check the group, check this girl to make sure because nothing really worked. The t the children's minister did not allow the animal in the room because the they they had a policy that wasn't written that you can't bring animals in the room. As you look to the future, somebody else out there be composing a paragraph about service animals. Because right now, if somebody could show up in your in your church with a service animal that happens to be a snake, say it's a service animal, and show up and be a part of what you're doing because you have no policy for it. Or how that works. This is this is when you look at the horizon and see the wave, this is what you get ready to surf. Because it's coming at all ages that comes forward. I think marijuana is going to be legal in seven years, five to seven years. Go ahead and think about it. Because you already have policies that say you can't drink you can't drink on campus, but you have nothing to say. You can't do something else that alters your mind on, on, on this campus or travel it with you. You say no illegal substances, so what happens when it's legal? You have a graduated senior that's 18 years old, goes on, goes on the mission trip with a big old bag. Your rule says it's fine. You've got to think ahead to how it's happening and go from there. Also, we're going, the school system is moving to a no dress code. I used to have a, a deal with the youth that I worked with is that when you come on campus to, to youth group, when you come on campus, you could wear whatever you wanted. I didn't care. You didn't have to dress dress code on campus because I wanted people off the street to come in. I didn't care. You know, you know, however you were, come on in. When we traveled, you had to wear school dress code. 
was my policy that we have, that we had built into those policies. You're about to hit a system in the North Carolina school systems of where there will be no dress codes to school because it's restrictive to body image. And they've had all these major cases that are coming around, especially starting in high school. And everybody's real excited about wearing their pajamas too. So it should be a rule. You only wear your pajamas to class when you're in college. But now they want to do it in high school. But see, these are the things you got to keep an eye on to what's coming up. To see how it develops and comes along and keep an ear to the ground. And also, what are you when you get back together and think about this process later on, what is happening in the preschool hall with the parents and the children to know how can we move this to a better policy? Kindergarten to fifth grade, what's going on there? Do we need phone policies there? You know, are they, do they keep asking us what the Wi-Fi password is? You know, how do we move through what that looks like? How is the interactions happening there? And we could write volumes of what needs to happen in youth ministry because the, that culture changes every three months along with, the, along with language to move forward. We have hit under an hour explaining the intricacies of your safe sanctuary policy. Normally it takes about six hours. So here's what I, here's what, here's your next steps. Now, did I, is your staff, is there anything I didn't hit we need to go over? No, I think you got everything. Okay. One of me, there was some third part we need to hit. Here's what I would like to require of y'all too, to give you homework. Um, go home and get a highlighter and go through the policy with what is, and what is vitally important to you and what you have questions about you need to ask about. Because there's not a staff member here that will not that would love to have a, a cup of coffee or a soda or something, especially if you buy it, um, to talk about the why of what this is. I can give you thirty thousand foot whys. They can give you the two inch why of the reason this works that way. The golden part about the whole thing is this: we get the privilege of working with these young men of guiding them in the way of discipleship. Because they're not going to listen to what we say. They're out there, they're going to do what we do. But we get a chance to live with them and be with them, then to discover God, and we get to watch them discover God, and we get to learn more about that. Whether we're playing games, whether we're teaching the Bible, whether all this works out. This is just the beginning of how we keep ourselves safe about that and moving forward as a group. So let me say one more word of prayer for us. And then if you need to bolt, head on out. If you have further questions, we can talk about questions from there. But let me pray for us. God, yet again, you are so powerful and awesome and mighty. Thank you for this assembled group here that is going to set the example for you for the next year. For infants that can't even process what's happened, but just knowing they're being held and loved the way you love us. For children that are just coming into new ways of thinking, that their thoughts about God will be molded and they'll be listened to. For youth and adolescents and young adults that are moving forward in their lives and are processing and their, their brains are changing, their bodies are changing, and we get to create this safe place for them to do that while learning the most about you and having an awesome time. I pray you bring your grace and your spirit and all the fruits of your spirit down upon these folks as they move forward with this proper alignment of going forward, thinking about their owning their policies into this and what it is now and where it can grow in the future. Thank you, God. We love you very much. Amen. Amen.